Welcome to the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show, episode number 64. My guest tonight is uh, Richard Patrick. Richard is best known as the lead singer of the rock band Filter. Richard was also the guitar player in Nine Inch Nails back in the early days of Nine Inch Nails. And he had a side project with the DeLeo brothers from Stone Temple Pilots, and that project was called Army of Anyone. Now, Filter went on to sell millions of albums and had many top radio hits. Now, during this conversation, Richard and I chat about his childhood and how he got into music, of course. But we also talk about, you know, how he met up with Trent Reznor, joined Nine Inch Nails, and then why he left Nine Inch Nails to form Filter. You know, we talked about his uh, battle with alcohol and uh, becoming sober. And we also talk about new Filter music that Richard is currently working on. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you like this show, please make sure to go over to Apple iTunes and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a new episode. You can also uh, give us a little rating while you're over there. That always helps with the uh, with our our rankings, I guess you would say, on the Apple Music Podcasts. And if you're feeling really nice, go ahead and leave us a review. I'd love to hear how uh, how you like the show. And as always... You know, make sure you go over to uh, social media. Find us over there. Probably most active on Instagram, but you can follow us at r r Coffee Show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. It's Joe with the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. I want to take a quick minute before we get on to our conversation with this week's guest and tell you about Anchor.fm. As you may know, here at the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show, we use Anchor.fm for our podcast hosting. Why do we use Anchor, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. For one, it's easy. Anchor's creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Number two, after you're done editing your podcast, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And the best part about using Anchor for your podcast hosting is you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership right from the start. Oh, and did I mention it's all free? Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go download the free app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And don't forget to let them know the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show sent you. Hello. Richard. Yeah. Hey, man, Joe with the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. How are you? Rock and roll coffee, baby pop. Yeah, you got some coffee ready to rock and roll? I'm doing good. I don't need any coffee right now. <laughs> it's a little late. Where are you located? Los Angeles. Oh, so it's still early. You can drink some coffee. Are you from New York? No, I'm actually in uh, Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach? Yeah. That's where I uh, cut my teeth as a, as, a, as a songwriter. What were you doing over here? Did you live here? I lived in my mom and dad's beach house while I wrote a little bit of short bus. Nice. And, um, Hey man, nice shot was written. The beginnings of Hey man, nice shot was written right on sunset beach. Nice. I, I was not aware of that. Yeah. Small world. So you're out in Los Angeles now and you guys just did, uh, you just had a live show, I believe. Are we doing the podcast right now? Oh, yeah. We just go right from the start. Right on. <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we played our first show. It was wild. I, was, I felt a little rusty, to be honest with you. I have, to, I, I have to lock myself in a rehearsal hall with my band for a couple of days next time. <laughs> you didn't have any major, uh, major uh, malfunctions, did you? I, I, I kind of forgot some stuff in oh, the song. No. I kind of forgot some vocals, and I, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> when that, good, when that hey, happens, when, do you just uh, mumble, or what do you, what do you do? I just, sometimes I just start laughing. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you make, <laughs> I mean, some of, some of the most charming moments I've ever seen in concerts is when the lead singer is, is kind of like making a mistake, or someone makes a big mistake. Yeah. The, the way they laugh it off and they kind of, they, they kind of like, they get charming. And I think that like, there's, there's, there, there's just kind of a way to like apologize without losing like your credibility. It's just like, Hey, 
this is a live show and I'm going to fuck up and I want it to be just as good as it can be. But like at the same time, shit's going to happen. And that's why we're playing it live. You know what I mean? That's why it's live. Yeah, you know? it happens. I mean, it could be worse, I guess, if you're Millie Vanilli, right? Exactly. If, <laughs> if the CD starts skipping, you're in big trouble. <laughs> well, how, how was the show? How was the turnout? It was all right. It was Savannah, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. I heard um, they were advertising it up here in Myrtle Beach. That's how oh, I knew yeah. about it. Yeah, it was It was great. I was with, uh, who played with you? Puddle Mud and Sponge? Yep. Okay, okay. I bet people are probably still a little, uh, little unsure about the big crowds, I would imagine. Well, you know, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the first thing I said was, I want to thank science for right. getting us back. And like half the crowd like didn't re react. Oh, you know geez. what I mean? I'm like, oh Jesus! <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> you can't, can't even acknowledge science. Oh. Here's the science. What, so let me ask you this: um, Now you grew up in in um, Ohio, correct? Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Okay, is that that's where you're? You weren't born there, but you grew up your childhood there. I wasn't born there, but I, I lived pretty much my, my formative years there from like 1977 to like 1989, 90, 91, 92. Okay. So for a long time. Now, what, growing up, was your family into entertainment? Because you and your brother have made big marks in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Um, no, we were, my mom and dad, my dad was a Republican banker. You know, like a, I, I'm not saying not, not Republican, like a conservative banker. Um, he, he worked at society national bank and which later turned into key corp. And he was like the chief financial officer there played a lot of golf. Um, my mom is from the South. She's from little rock, Arkansas. Um, and so we just lived in Cleveland, pretty modest life. My brother, Robert, um, got it just felt like he just needed to shake the dust of this small town off his boots and like go to a big city and see if he could survive and he made it to Los Angeles and and um little by little he just got discovered and and uh by James Cameron and uh, boom he was in Terminator 2 and the rest is history and then I you know I was palling around with my friends from Cleveland, Ohio. One of the guys that I met, who was from he he was from this band called the Exotic Birds, was this guy named Trent. And he, rumor had it that he got a record deal, and um, he was putting together his live band. And then I I bumped into him, and he said, "Do you want to join?" And I said, sure. So I joined Nine Inch Nails like around 1988 and then um, toured with Nine Inch Nails all the way up until like 1993. Then I split because I wanted to be a singer songwriter on my own and got signed to Warner Brothers Records um, when Warner Brothers was when we were working on the record, they were like, Hey, do you mind if we put the song, Hey man, I shot on it on the demon night soundtrack. And I said, sure. And, um, a DJ in Colorado Springs, um, started playing, Hey man, I shot on the radio. And two weeks later it was on 50 stations. Two weeks after that, it was on 300 stations. Two weeks after that, it was on every station and, and that played, you know, alternative rock and roll, which was huge back then. So it just blew up. It just blew up. It went viral. Uh, yeah. Viral before the, viral. As the kids say today, viral, <laughs> uh, because it had no radio promotions whatsoever. It was just a song. And That's so amazing. the record company was furious that all of a sudden it happened and they didn't have a record out. So they forced, they forced us to go mix everything, which was great. I was, I was like, fuck yeah, I'm tired of writing. Yeah. And forced us, they, they begged us to, to, to mix the record. We mixed it with Ben Gross in Detroit. When I came back from Detroit, I had left and no one knew who I was. When I came back, I was the number one song on 
Cleveland's MMS rec, uh, radio station and filter had been born. And my friend went, uh, came and got me cause we were going to go ride mountain bikes. His name is Scott Kern. And I was getting back. It was like May. And he was like, he's like, um, yeah, check it out. And, and, and like, we're driving somewhere and I'm like, uh, Hey man, nice shots on. And I'm like, what is that? Like, what did, did you get the CD or like, I don't like, so you I'm had not, no clue. I'm not playing the CD. What are you doing? Do you have a cassette of it? And he goes, dude, that's the fucking radio. And so that's when I heard, hey, man, I shot on the radio for the first time was with my friend Scott Kern. And um, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to, um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, growing up, you and your brother. I mean, did you guys get along or were you fighting at each other the whole time? No, he was, <laughs> he was, a, he was nine years older than me. Okay. So I didn't him that much because he was already he like left high school as soon as he turned 18 mm-hmm. left house he lived in michigan for a little while and then he came back to cleveland and worked as a bartender or as a uh, like a waiter and he was he was you know he was a night owl he would work nights and he would be asleep all day and uh, he didn't stay with us back then he stayed like down the street in, in an apartment building and um he was always just like, it was always just going to be like, yeah, I'm doing this. Like I'm doing it. Yeah. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go do it. And he had, he kind of, he, he feels like he had wasted some time and he was in a boating accident where the boat literally, uh, just sunk and he had to swim back to shore with my brother Lou oh, and shit. my brother Lou had a life preserver, Robert had to swim all the way back to shore and get some help from the local marina that they had, they had, uh, um, been at and, um, or they, they launched the boat from and they got into a cigarette and they just went around the, the, the Lake Erie and, and picked everybody up. And then the, the then the, 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 uh, whatever it is, the, um, what is it? The coast guard, the mm-hmm. coast guard came in and, and started helping. And they found everybody um, that was on the boat. And on the way back, my brother prayed to God that he wouldn't waste his life anymore. And he said, God, if you can get me out of this, I'm, I'm going to go to L.A. and become a movie star. And like that, that was his big like come yeah. to Jesus moment for what, him. When was you, what was your, um, your first moment that got you interested in music? Oh, my God. Um, Well, I loved music. My dad played a lot of Neil Diamond in the house, and uh, it was always, he always cranked music, like at what he called concert hall volume. He He always had a big stereo, and he would blast his stereo super loud, and I would just love it. Like, I could feel the drums and the rhythm and the, the guitar and so I was just immediately captivated by music, like early on, like um, probably like when I was three or four years old. And then I saw a guitar at someone's house, and I'll never forget. It was the most. It was a brand new Gibson SG, nice, and just been polished. And like the sun was coming through like the window, and it was. Sparkling. It was like the most beautiful, glistening, sparkly thing I had ever seen in my life, and I was like, I gotta get a guitar. So, right around like when I was nine years old, I started like, Mom, can I get an acoustic? And she's like, Sure. So she got me an acoustic, and then like six weeks later, I'm like, Mom, can I get an electric? And <laughs> yeah, and she and she, and they just were like, Great, he's showing interest in something. Yeah. Go for. It. So they just kept buying me new guitar, like, you know, getting me new guitars when I needed them and uh, calling it Christmas presents or whatever. Yeah. And so- that, that's right around 9, 10, 11 is when I really started to just play guitar all the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I started singing around that time, too. Were you self-taught? Yeah. Uh, no, I had a guitar teacher for a little while. He taught me the blues scales and stuff like that. How do you, 
like you were you self-taught singing also or did you have a, a coach no i was self-taught singing so how, how do you practice that just different songs you're singing or different styles i mean how do you develop your own voice you just go for it i tried to sing along to the radio i tried singing along to like um all the records i liked you know um a lot of rolling stones a lot of clash hmm. uh, doesn't seem to work for me trying. like i really have to project your voice and you have to like try yeah. it, 90 90 percent of it is just getting off your butt and trying it and really digging in and like because at first everyone's like oh i don't know about your voice and like you just keep going for it you just like for a long time, like during short bus, I still didn't really consider myself like a great singer or anything like that. Mm. And so, like I had to, like by the time I went platinum with short bus, I was working on um, title of record, and I was like, "This is the record where I'm going to sing in as 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 developed as I can." And that's that's when like take a picture and stuff like that started happening. Yeah, so like take a picture. That was probably one of your first like really singing songs, right? Yeah, that was like straight up like no holds barred, gonna sing. I, I you know all the all the haters are gonna hate, but I'm gonna sing this fucker. You know, like sing this the way I want to sing it. Yeah, yeah. Now, were you confident going into that, or or like you said, you were just you were still yeah, that, finding? I had forgiven myself for being afraid or or hating or self-doubting because i i was like well you went platinum so something's working yeah and but it took me going platinum to really believe that i was a good singer yeah yeah now when you met up with trent he wasn't nine inch nails yet right you guys, no, you guys did that together called- what's that he was in this band called the exotic birds right so you guys did nine inch nails the beginning together correct um i wouldn't say that he he kind of invited me early on uh and we we could have worked together but i wasn't sold on it yet i was still trying to figure out if i could do my my gig which was the act at the time mm-hmm. you gotta remember we were like 18 19 years old and so um he started demoing and went into like a seclusion back in like 1987, 88 and went into almost like a look, a, a seclusion and wrote a bunch of music, which later ended up be, becoming pretty hate machine. Mm-hmm. And I was screwing around with my music and then he had, um, pretty hate machine pretty much done by the time i was in the band okay okay so you came in and we're playing guitar out on the road yeah okay i did, i did play some sound design i did do some guitar stuff on the record um because i was like yo man i want to be on the record so i i i, I made a guitar like feedback part between the song sanctified and something i can never have Hey, you got on there, right? So I'm on the record. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, by the skin of my teeth, because he was starting to, he was starting to master everything and like edit everything. And, um, but I would say the real kind of influence I had was, was during the touring. I constantly was constantly trying to keep it heavy and mean because if you if you listen to like Pretty Hate Machine, there's there's like literally there's a hip hop song on it, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's like there's there's several moments that are like almost new wave kind of pop, you know. Well, you got me working so hard lately, working my hands until they bleed. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, it's extremely like some of it's really pop. But I gravitated to the stuff that was like, you know, had like a whole, you know, terrible lie, sanctified. Um, I was trying to gra- gravitate to the more like mean, heavy shit. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so that's 
when when broken came out and the reason why that record sounds so different is because you know trent listed us as as influences on that record and um i i think that just me kind of constantly saying keep it heavy keep it mean keep it really tough like i was i was on the the side of that kind of stuff because i was really influenced by like skinny puppy and ministry and stuff like that when Mm -hmm. when that when i joined nine inch nails i was fully committed to like industrial got it now did you already know how to create that type of music or did you learn a lot from being in nine inch nails oh no i was really really starting to like the, the the there was a there was a couple of songs i did that were really i i wish i had them still but i i did that were really just heavy as shit and mean and, and you know, and industrial sounding. But again, it was, it sounded kind of like, Oh, you're listening to ministry and skinny puppy. I get it. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I was already like f- fully committed to that kind of sound. Cause when I, when Trent saw me play in this band called collapse, he goes, dude, what got into you, man? You're totally like heavy and, like into uh, industrial and everything. And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Like, I, like I don't listen to anything that's not like, you know, coming off of wax tracks or network or mm-hmm. uh, I was just fully, I, I was convinced that industrial was going to be huge and, and not even really, I, I wasn't even calculating it. It, you know, like I wasn't thinking on that level. I was just like, fuck it. It makes me feel so fucking good. Yeah scream you know stigmata you know like like the ministry stuff that had come out and all that stuff that that was land of rape and honey was like life-changing so when when was the moment where you thought to yourself maybe i should go off and do something on my own (sighs) well it was always there it was always there it was always like this 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 kind of this this bug in my ear that was just like but it was basically it was right around when Trent was working on the downward spiral and you know, it, it, it just, it just felt like it was time. I won't go into the gory details um, about like just some of the business phenomena, you know, some of the business things that went down Mm -hmm. that were, that were really disturbing to me. Um, But it was just, it was just like, you know what? I, I, appreciate everything Trent's done. I really liked being in his band, but it was just time for me to leave. I was just like, I I really feel like I can do more on my own for myself. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like I, I, I was a better singer songwriter than I was a guitar player for him. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I could, I could go off and do a lot more, you know, with my life, uh, you know, when I did filter. Did you have a collection of songs when you made that move? Yeah, I I mean I made the move. I I had six record companies begging to sign me. Okay, so you were already so, getting your stuff out there to the record record execs. I, I was already shopping my music around and I was getting insane like offers. Wow. <laughs> so you, I was just like cuz I was like if I quit I better have some fucking, you know, it's like you don't quit one thing to to just flounder and, 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 and you know, like you, you got to have a stepping off point. You got to have like a backup plan. Yeah. And they and were pretty well known at that time, right? Nine Inch Nails. That was a. We were, we were huge. Yeah. We had just Alpalooza and our record was fucking going crazy. It was all over MTV. Head Like a Hole was a massive hit. Dude, that that takes balls to step away from yeah. something like that. That was that's exactly that's exactly right. It takes a shit ton of balls. And if I would have stayed, I I probably would have gone crazy. But I probably would have, I, I you know, like I I, I probably would have just gone crazy. Mm-hmm. So so you stepped away, and then you you created Short Bus pretty much all on your own, correct? Yeah, I mean, I had friends, you know, come in and out and people would be in the room when I was writing stuff and, you know, try and, you know, uh, take credit for it and stuff like that. But it was really just basically just me and my guitar and whoever was producing it at the time. I think Brian Lee Skang was kind of producing. He was producing. He produced that. He, he co-produced that record with me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And then, like you said, uh, hey, man, nice shot took off without even promoting it. You know, and yeah. as a matter of fact, you know, I don't know if you're into video games or anything, but uh, when I was younger, I was at a bar and you know those games that you play? It's it's like a trivia thing and then, it, you know, they do it on the TVs and everybody in the bar can play it. Yeah. Well, you, you had to pick a name. You had to put a name up there. And I was I was looking at the screen. I'm like, I don't what am I going to put? I don't want to put my real name up there. And then that song came on at the bar. So my name on this game became Filter. And then my three numbers after that, that were my baseball numbers. And to this day, my gaming tag when I play video games, now my son uses it, is Filter, those numbers, because you're banned. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but um, so anyway, so Short Bus comes out. It's a hit. Now, did what tours did you guys go on? Did you get on some big tours with that? Yeah, we toured with uh, White Zombie. Um, we toured with um, the biggest tour was Smashing Pumpkins in Europe. And were that, you guys well received? That, huge, totally well received. It set us up for a, a lot of great stuff over there. Uh huh. You there? Yeah. Okay. I don't, know, what I don't know what's going on with my mic. There. You can hear me okay, right? Yeah, I think we're just stepping on each other. Yeah. yeah. You know, technology. Um, all right, so so Short Bus came out, and then you did these tours, and then you went in to do your follow-up. Uh, was there high expectations for you now? Totally. Were you Were you, like, shitting your pants, or were you ready to go? I was excited. I was happy. I, I was like, now I get to like work with other people that I've toured with. Um, I worked with Steve Gillis for the first time. I worked with Gino Leonardo. Um, Frank Cavanaugh played a little bit of bass on it. Um, and I and I worked with this guy named Ray DeLeo. And he is just this amazing programmer slash producer. And um, title of record was a joy. It was just absolute joy. I, I mean, there was, there's was always the added pressure of like, now it's gotta be huge, you know? Yeah. But, but I, I take a picture to me came from such a good place. Like I was so happy that I wrote the song. Cause I mean, it was basically like Billy Corgan was like, you know, Rich, it's, it's just, it, all you have to do is just make sure you write a good hit song and, and, you know, you can stay in that top 40 for as long as you want. And I, and I just remember thinking to myself, I want to write a song that's all about like my personal problems with drinking and stuff like that, but like write it with the music being like this gorgeous, like the sound of the way drugs made me feel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how, how luscious and gorgeous and, and, and it's, it's supposed to sound like just like, you know, an injection of heroin into your, you know what I mean? Like it's supposed to, that's how I wanted it to sound. Yeah. And so I kind of completed all my tasks and then I, then I welcome to the fold. I just consider to be like just one of my most, it's just one of the most amazing songs to perform live. Best things was great. Um, Miss blue cancer. I will lead you. That, uh, that was your biggest album. The correct? record. I'm just listing the record. Yeah. Was that your biggest album? Uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so you guys went on tour with, you did some shows with Guns N' Roses too, which did not go so well, correct? Uh, when I was in Nine Inch Nails. Oh, that was with Nine Inch Nails. Okay. Tell me about yeah. that. Back up a little bit and tell me about that. Because I heard a little bit about that, but I don't, what, what was so bad about that tour? Um, well, Axel wasn't going on stage. Like he was just, yeah. he just wasn't performing. So they would, he, he would make the audience wait like hours and hours to, to go on. And, um, we showed up, you know, we're fresh off of Lollapalooza, which is this big alternative scene. You know, it's like this great, like mixing pot of, of like alternative kids who would never go to a, a Guns N' Roses concert. And then we show up to the Guns N' Roses concert in Europe, and it was just like, it was just like the 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 people were just they were just this rough and tumble. You know, I don't want to 
I don't want to list all their jobs, what probably what they do for a living, but like y- you could, you could definitely see some gas station attend. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there was, they, they, there was just a rough kind of like the alternative scene. It's, it's more like upper middle class, well-educated kind of, you know, alternative kids that listen to Depeche Mode and U2 and The Cure. Right. Gains Addiction and you know and you know what i mean but like the the guns and roses crowd was like the hair metal kid those guys and they were pissed they didn't fucking see a bunch of alternative kids playing synthesizers yeah so it just went over really bad even though axel is really nice and he was really sweet to me back then and and you know it was it was nice to do the shows um, because, you know, Axel invited us and put us in front of, you know, 50,000 people in Europe, you know, but we went on stage and it was just like an abortion. Yeah. They started throwing sausages at us. Sausages. Ju- sausages. That's a, a weird thing to throw at you. But in all honesty, I'm proud of that. <laughs> like I, 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 I wouldn't, I didn't want to be fucking liked by the, the hair metal people from Europe. I didn't yeah. give a fuck what they thought. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was like, I was like, fuck that. I'd rather, I'd rather just fucking hang out with our kids. Yeah. Okay. I, I was just curious about that. So, yeah. so let me ask you this. How come, I mean, filter has had a lot of different members in the band. Sure. How come not sticking with just a, a band? Well, I think it's, I think it, honestly, it's, you know, if you're in U2, like if you're in U2, you're worth probably half a billion dollars. Like, like if you're a Beatle, you're, you're worth like, you're, 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 you're you know, other than Yoko or whatever that happened and John Lennon's untimely death, like those guys could get back together and they could tour and they could tour for probably like three or four hundred million dollars. Mm-hmm. Right. When you're in a small band and you're trying to keep everybody legitimately happy and all their creature comforts and all the things that they want. You just you just can't really do that, um, and keep everybody happy. And it's just like as as soon as as soon as you know, like I I made all the publishing. I mean, this is really technical kind of business talk, but sure. I was the main publish publisher. I'm the guy that makes all the money because I write most of the songs. So like people saw that and they were getting pissed and jealous, and it was just it was just kind of like hey. I, 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 I'm sorry, we're not going on tour. And plus when I went into rehab, when I went into rehab, that really pissed everyone off. And it was just kind of like, you know what? I'd rather have a fresh start. Mm-hmm. A lot of these guys that were with me when I was, when I was using drugs and alcohol, they were enablers. I mean, they were straight up right there with me. And when I got sober, a lot of them were like, fuck this. Why are you, what, I'm supposed to get sober? And I'm like, no, you're not supposed to get sober, but I just don't want to be around you when you're drunk. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go on tour with you if you're going to be drunk. And, you know, there's just a million things that kind of start gnawing away at you. But the main thing is, is that this is my baby and I want to be able to work with whoever I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And... You know, Gino was great for a record, and then we did then we did the amalgamate, and it just was like I was ready for a change. So I I worked with John Five, and I worked with some other people on Anthems for the Damned, um, and then I started working with Bob Marlette. And after a while, you just start going on tour, and people are like, "Well, I can't really commit to a six week tour because I'm I'm going back to school or." I'm going to be doing this or I'm going to be doing that. Like right now I have a drummer who's going on tour with Kesha and I have to schedule in a new drummer right now just because <laughs> my boys, my boy who's going to be on the record and and who's close to being as much of a member um, of Filter, but like he's going to go on with Kesha, he's going to go on tour with Kesha and he's going to make a shit ton of fucking money. Yeah. And, and like, I can't deny that. Sure. So if you're if you're you too, being in a band is fairly fucking easy. 
because everyone's a gazillionaire. Every show is sold out. Every fucking th- you you know like everything's been planned out. You're you're on Lear Jets. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're 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 fucking together. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the business side of it, you know, and and just the kind of the craziness side of it. And I I I, I would have liked to have had like a gang that was with me forever, and we were the same, and we and it was the same guys. Which is pretty much what I've had for the past ten years with like Johnny Radke. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had Johnny Radke in the band for almost ten years now. Um, I've had Bobby Miller for almost ten years. He plays bass. I mean, he plays a lot of stuff actually. And you know, I, I mean, it 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 seems like a really good idea at the time. Like, yeah, let's be in a band, and we'll it'll be a band. But I kind of learned from Trent that, like, if you want to do something and no one wants to do it, or, or or if people are flaking out on you, fuck it, replace them. Yeah, you know what I mean. And 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 that's how I felt in Nine Inch Nails. Like I was like, you know, I could be replaced at any moment in time. You know, like like if I piss them off or if I say something wrong or you know what I mean. I always felt like I was auditioning, and that's kind of why I left is, is, is another reason. It's just total freedom to be able to do whatever you want. I want to work with Bob Marlette. I want to work with Johnny Radke. I want to work with, you know, um, different producer Zach Monowitz from, from Connecticut. I found a kid on Instagram who plays this insane guitar and I'm like, yo, let's write together. So he, he sent me a bunch of music and he's now, he's got three songs on the record with me. Wow, and it's just it's just some kid I met on Instagram. He's like 22 years old. He's just graduated Berkeley uh, Music School, and I'm just like, you are an insane guitar player, and I want to I want to sing over your guitar playing, and, and like you know, let's do something. And he sent me a bunch of songs, and I picked about two or three. You know that that just that that's so cool that you would do something yeah. like that because a lot of people won't would never do that. But see, that's the thing. I I know good shit when i hear it like i know like what i want like and this kid is freaking out he's 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 just like i'm writing in filter <laughs> you know i'm writing with richard patrick for filter was, was and he, if you hear this shit it's fucking it's the next level was he familiar it's, with filter yeah yeah wow you know he was born when short bus came out but you know <laughs> i mean <laughs> that's kind of crazy to say but it's true yeah no that's amazing and that, that, yeah, that's so cool. and it's that kind of spontaneity and that kind of and see, I could never do it if I was like with one guitar player forever, you know. And 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 and, and look at you too. Bono gets fucking a beautiful day. Bono gets you know pride in the name of love. Bono gets like such amazing original you know music. That like Bono's not really, you know what I mean? Bono's like, fuck, I'm getting, I mean, look at, look at Robert Plant. He gets Jimmy Page, you know? And that was kind of another thing. It was like, yo dudes, you gotta, you gotta deliver like fucking top notch, fucking amazing shit, like all the time. And like, you know, some of the guys that I worked with in the past, I mean, their biggest problem is they're still drinking like the way we used to when we were kids. Yeah. And it's just like their music has turned mushy and and weird and unconnected and and it's like yo dude I don't want to I, I want to be on the cutting edge sometimes you know I want to I want to work with people that are like you know excited and crazy and you know yeah they're younger and they're 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 more you know insane and that's what I like I, I so there's a whole myriad of reasons why I've had so many different bandmates but. Honestly, I'm jealous of Rez. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Rez? Rez? R E Z Z. I don't think so. I'll write that down and look it up though. R E Z Z. I just saw her play at the Greek Theater in front of 6,000 people. She has a laptop and a light show. That's it. And 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 googly eyes and crazy like Google like these lit up uh, LED light things that she puts on her eyes, and it's the best music. It's fucking amazing. I sat through. I sat. I, I literally ordered tickets like I was, you know, a kid, 
got in the front row, sat there for the show, enjoyed it, and then left and like <laughs> by myself and like sat there with my hands up in the air, like rocking out to, to res. This girl, 20, she's 26 years old and she's from Ontario and she's just this huge EDM artist on Dead Mouse Records and fucking loved it. Maybe you need to collaborate with her. I would love it, but she's, I think she's too cool for, she's kind of like, she's too cool for school, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. You never know. The answer, I always like to say, the answer is always no if you don't ask. Yeah, well, I, 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 sh I probably should. I would love to do something with her. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, so when you're clap, when you and I mean, and all she has is literally it's a laptop and a light show, and that's it, and it's fucking awesome. And she creates. And I'm it like, all. I'm like, if if Short Bus came out now, there's there's no telling how like I would have approached it, you know, like because remember the whole thing was a computer. We were sitting there with a computer and a drum machine. Yeah, short bus. Like yeah. we we weren't even supposed to bring drums in the in the original short bus. Like what we, the only reason we the only reason we had drums on like we the reason why we we had drum machine on the record is because we didn't know any better. Yeah, we were like we don't need drums. This isn't we don't have to be rock if we don't want to be rock. We can just be industrial. We can bring a drum machine if we want to. You know, like I mean. There was no telling what we could have done back then. What What are you using when you're creating that kind of stuff on the drum machines and stuff? What What kind of equipment or programs are you using? Oh, I use um, well, my 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 DAW, my digital audio workstation, is Logic Pro X, and I just have tons of samples and and I just I use I use uh, for uh, for acoustic sound drums. I use a lot of Get Good Drums. GGD sample uh, library. Um, I just, you know, you find sounds and you just, you just go crazy. Sometimes like we, for a short bus, we did a lot of wild stuff. We would take a speaker and put it in a dryer and then like play a sample of a snare drum and then like record the dryer. Like, so it was like, Pah! you know, and, and huh. we would just like get drunk and do all sorts of shit like that. And a lot of a lot of short bus was like found or, or, you know made up sounds like that that's awesome now you yeah. you had mentioned you'd get drunk and do that now it's no secret you had an issue with alcohol <laughs> are you kidding <laughs> when i went into rehab bud <laughs> bud light almost went into bankruptcy <laughs> what i mean when when was the turning point for you like when did you say whoa enough's enough i need to do something when i couldn't get on stage when I was so drunk, I couldn't even fucking walk on stage. And when I got on stage, I was so wasted that I was like, I f I'm sorry. Like, I was like, I'm sorry. I can't play. I'm just so fucking wasted. And I'd like wander off and it was terrible. Mm. It was, it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me was my alcoholism. Yeah. Did that start young? Or did, it, did that not start? Not until? really. No, I was always an addict. Like, like uh, you're born with this thing that, that, like, you know, like, you know, if, if I could, if you know, if my mom had a bag of suckers, like, you know, candy, I would, I would eat the bag. Like, I was just crazy. Like, yeah. it was just like, oh, that's good. You know, it's better than that. Ten. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like. And when I started drinking, I noticed early on, like, you drink way more than your friends. Like, my friends were like, I can have a couple beers and stop. And I was like, not me. Yeah. Why would you want to? <laughs> oh, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, when I smoke cigarettes, it's three packs a day. It's, there's no two or three a day. There's no four or five a day. There's fucking three packs You're going a day. For the pack. Man. If I vape, I vape like fucking two hundred dollars worth of juice every week, dude. There's like I yeah. The, tell me about it. It's yeah. I have no stop button. Like it's, like if I like if I started smoking cigars, I'd have to buy like enough cigars <laughs> to last me like a, a full day, like two or three a day. <sighs> So, I mean, with the addiction that bad, I mean, how did you overcome that? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people that might be listening now that are in a situation. How did you find your way out? It was rehab. Rehab. Was rehab, and, and there's a program, a secret society, a program that they 
you know, teach and that you're not allowed to really talk about it, but it starts with the letter A mm. and ends with the letter A. <laughs> and, um, but it's a, it's a program for people like me who, who just can't say no to the first one. And then by doing that, they can't, you know, it's like drinking beer is, I can't say yes to one because one's too many because a thousand's not enough. Like mm. it's, I, I I don't have an off button. So when I went into rehab, I was very lucky. I was uh, I bumped into a guy named Chris Cornell from Soundgarden, and he um, had like three or four more days than me. And I was really lucky because he was just the perfect influence on me. Like I was gonna walk out, and he said, "Rich, this is the only deal in town, man." this is the only place in town. And, um, he's like, you gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta stick here and give it a shot. And I said, okay. And I stayed. And so you can imagine how bad I felt when he, commu- when he committed suicide, Yeah, like, you know, he, he lost his way, you know, but because of his, you know, because of his mistake, I'm, I'm alive and I know full well that that's what happens. You know, when you when you go off your program and you start using again, this is what happens. Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 that program of recovery that like makes makes the most sense to me. And um I, I get to hang out with people that are exactly who understand, of course, of course you're gonna fucking smoke three packs a day. Of course. Yeah. I get you. I understand you, bro. I'm an addict too, you know, and, and like I, I you know, I I, I I love my kind and I hang out with my kind once a week and we just we just talk about being sober and 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 how it's worked and yeah and it's been 18 years. Congratulations. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now you've you've had friends. I'm sure you were friends with uh Scott. Scott, Martin, Chester, and Chester, Chris, and Chris. All of so them. So you've seen them all go down that path. I mean, yeah. does that frighten you? absolutely yeah the last time i really saw chester was at chris cornell's funeral and um i felt terrible about it and um chester was i think he had i think he he looked a little bit like he had been using but i couldn't tell but uh yeah it just sucks and scott wyland you know just it's it's all it's all just gross. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a terrible disease and it's real and, and and if you get caught up in it and you know you're not careful you will die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations again on your 18 years and you know you keep it going. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Now um filter did you ha- that had an effect on filter when you went in there, right? I mean, did that put you guys set you guys back on your third album? Uh, no, the third record, the third record's problem was, yeah, I went to rehab the the day it came out, so I couldn't tour on that record, and the record company was furious. Yeah, because you had a big song off that. Where do we go from here? Yeah, and I it was I had trouble. I I did like um, I think I did I don't know what it was, but I did a late night show. And um, I was on Conan, I think. And we were promoting the record, and it was great. Except I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't sing it. I, I, it was really hard, and I was just wasted all the time. Mm-hmm. So when I went into rehab, it like really pissed everyone off. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to get. I didn't want to get back together with Gino and Frank and and Steve. I, I just didn't want to get back. I wanted to start something brand new. Is that when you started uh, Army of Anyone? Yeah, Army of Anyone popped up, and it was just amazing. It was like a breath of fresh air. It was just like, you know, Robert and Dean come in, and it's just like what I talked about with, like, you know, Bono has the edge. Yeah. You know, like Robert and Dean are songwriters. Like, they've, you know, they, they 11 number one songs during the 90s, you know. Right. Um, and they were just, like, had tons of ideas and, a little bit more laid back than I am, but still really cool. Great experience. And Ray Luzier was amazing. 
you know, getting to watch Ray play every night. And it was just, you know, it was just one of those things. I think it was just it, it like it, it, it did its thing. And um, it re- it kind of made me realize how much I missed Filter. And um, so when I came back to Filter, it was um, it was way after Army of Anyone. It was like 2000, 2008, I think, four mm-hmm. years, five years later. Army of Anyone, and that wasn't around that long, was it? No. Mm-hmm. Is it that- was just like a one-time thing. It was just like a one, one record thing. Uh-huh. So when you came back with Filter uh, at that time, where I'm trying to remember what the scene was like back then. What was was it different from when you were in it before? Yeah, it was it was way different. Like the like the music scene had kind of changed, and um, yeah, I, I it was it was it was different. It was a little more difficult. Totally. Yeah. I'm trying to think what was what the scene was like back then, but I don't remember. I mean, it was like Coldplay and um I don't know, the 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 kind of the heavy guitar, you know, rock music was like Creed. Right, and, right. And Nickelback. Right. And that was the death of rock right there, you ask me. I mean, I, I straight up, uh, I'll, I, I mean, it, it, top 40 people were making fun of rock and making fun of Nickelback. And and it just never recovered, and that was the end of rock. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it never got cool again. Well, it's still cool. Well, <laughs> for who? <laughs> for me. I mean, I like it. Kind, kind of like this. I mean, maybe the Strokes... Or maybe maybe White Stripes mm-hmm. kind of kept it kept it relevant, but then it's 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 sadly it's it's taken a shit the last ten years. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just. I mean, Shine Down. You know, I yeah. I mean, it's just awful. Yeah, not a fan, huh? I mean, I think Shine Down's. I think Shinedown's good. I and I and I like those guys. They're nice guys. I just it's three doors down. Yeah. You know, just this just, just meaningless shit. You yeah. know, just this I mean, my favorite bands were, you know, you know, like in the last twenty years, I mean it's like the Deftones. The Deftones were amazing. Um but there's, there's, I don't even really listen to a lot of rock these days. I listen to like Rez and EDM and uh, um, who else? Um, Scarlord. 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 Scarlord is what I listen to right now. That's another one I'm going to write down and look up. Yeah, S C A R L X R D. X R D. Just fucking insane. So huh. good. I'll check that out definitely. So, um, now here we are in 2021. What are you working on now? Right now, it's the new record. They've got us right where they want us at each other's throats. That's the whole title. Yeah, that's a long and title. And I and I and I put out two singles uh, f- from what I would consider to be like a, a an EP called America. Right. M U R C A America. That was a few years ago, right? No, that was like six months ago. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah, America's been out for like maybe six months or a year. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah, like yeah, and Thoughts and Prayers came out. But I they these were just self released like dumps I just took out on YouTube. Hmm. Okay. Like I, I didn't promote them. I didn't have a t- promotion team or anything. I just wanted to get it out before the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make sure that someone had commented on the atrocities he did as a president and the the fucked up shit that he was trying to do. So I, I, I just had to say my bit. And <laughs> those are my two political songs. They're straight up. It's like it's like listening to the Clash, but like a lot heavier. Yeah, yeah. Are you into the politics and all that? I'm not into it per se like like yay. <laughs> like I'm I'm into it because I think that that Donald Trump was a tyrannical type of person. He's 
he you know it's coming out how close we came to like almost like a civil war i mean look at january 6th yeah that was absolutely an insurrection it wasn't a protest they were trying to interrupt the constitutional duties of mike pence and congress right and and uh and the senate and you know counting the electoral college is is the whole thing that's the whole fucking that's the that ceremony is like what democracy is based on. And I think that, that Donald Trump was absolutely trying to stop it. You got to fight like hell. You got, you got to fight like hell. Or you're going to lose your cunt country is mm-hmm. what he said. Mm-hmm. And and those people took it literally. They're saying they took it literally. They're all going to jail and they're, they're like, no the president told me to do it. You know? <laughs> and I, and I think that, um, I, th- I think that he's still in the wings still, he's still got Kevin McCarthy's, you know, ear and, uh, Mitch McConnell's ear. And, um, unfortunately he's using his, his political, um, weight is as a way to continue to try and hold on to power. It's a fucking awful mess and I hate it. And I, 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 the reason why I'm putting it into my music is because, this is what John Lennon did. This is what Bono would do. This is what Joe Strummer would do. This is what fucking Nivek Ogre would do. This is what, uh, you know, Al Jorgensen would do and is doing, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm right there with them, you know? Right. So, I mean, Rage Against the Machine ain't going to do it. <laughs> right. You know, they're, they ain't going to do it. Right. They're too busy fighting and, 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 you know, having problems. Yeah. You know, what, like, what, where do you find, I can't, you know, t- I, Chuck D can't be the only one. Right. Did you, you know? get a reaction with those, with those songs? Did I, did I see any action? No, did <laughs> no. Did you get any, uh, any reactions from anybody with those songs? Tons. Yeah. Tons and tons and tons. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm losing fans. You yeah. know, like I'm, 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 you know, Filter is losing fans because we're fucking saying what we want to say. That's you know, there's up. so many fucking people are just like stick, stick to music, asshole. Don't <laughs> fucking talk about fucking politics. Like fucking suck my mother fucking dick, <laughs> you little bitch. Uh. I'm not your fucking monkey. I'm not going to fucking, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to fucking entertain you. I'm fucking saying what I want to say, which is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's why I'm doing it. Yeah. Why can't you say what you want to say? Yeah. You know, it's my fucking band. You know, I fucking quit bigger bands to, to fucking do this. And I, and it's in a hell is high water. I don't care if people buy my records or not. Never cared about that shit. I mean, it's, it's awesome that they do. It's it's awesome that they're but I'm stoked. I mean, you know, I have a hundred thousand plays on on thoughts and prayers and a hundred thousand, you know, plays on on America and those two songs, literally the only thing that we did was we posted them on Facebook. I mean, you That's know, we, we hey, uh, here's a new song. Like they weren't promoted or anything, you know. And those songs are, you know, and, and there's so many people that are like, fuck yeah, it's finally someone's saying it, you know, and, you know, there's, there's so much encouragement, but there's definitely a lot of hate, but sticking to my guns is what I'm supposed to do. And yeah, man. Yeah. I have to. Do uh, you think, you know, with this day and age releasing music, I mean, is it, you feel it's easier for a band, a new band to get out there, of course, but in the, on the other side. Is it harder to get the bigger promotion for them? You- no, everybody's everybody's you know everybody's fighting for the same ear. You know what I mean? And um, I think it is easier for some people to to put out music, but I mean you you still got to have some curators in there that are going to sift out some of the bullshit. And um, you can't just rely on algorithms, you know, mm-hmm. from different streaming companies, but. At the same time, I mean, you know, I don't. I literally do not have to have a record contra- a company to 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 release music. I prove that, you right. know, by by just releasing America and Thoughts and Prayers, and um, you know, I signed because it's because I was I, I I I demanded that they take a certain amount of the promotions and like you know and like go for it worldwide and mm-hmm. um. 
you know, but like, you know, and plus it's, it's good to get a chunk of money to go off and, and finish the record. So it sounds great. Yeah. Who, who are you, you with know. now? What's, what's that? Golden what? Robot? Golden Robot. Okay. Yeah. I've seen them. They've got quite a few bands right now. Yeah. They get a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you know what, man? I mean, you've been through a lot of shit. You've accomplished a lot of shit. Are you happy where you're at at this point? Is this Fuck yeah. Yeah. Is it Part it of the reason why I'm super happy is because I've also started working in movies. I, I, I do movie scores now. And so half of my time is, is spent, you know, you know, you know, working with people like John Malkovich and, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Philippi and, um, you know, I sit in a dark room and these guys act and they've already done it and I'm adding music underneath. And it's just such a joy to, to do something different. But I mean, in these days, I'm rocking. I mean, I've got, I've got a wife and two kids. You know, I screw around on a golf course every once in a while, or I'll I'll, I'll work on someone's movie or whatever. But like, I mean, life's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. No, so movie. I, I've I've had a lot of guests on the show. I don't know if you've if you checked out the show before you came on, but I've had a lot of guests that have gotten into making music for movies and stuff, and that seems to be a pretty good way to go. I love it. I think it's amazing. Um, you know, Trent's made, you know, he's, he's done a lot of great work. He's actually won two Oscars. You know, he's, he, he, he was, him and I used to talk about like, man, wouldn't it be great to just come up with drones and sounds and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that and try and work with an orchestra and blah, 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 you know, and, and here we are getting the opportunity to do it. Yeah. It was definitely one of those, Trent and I basically had the same dreams growing up. That's why to, fr to front a band and to do movie scores and 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 we're both uh, able to do it and he's been a mentor my whole life and um i you know i uh i i'm digging i'm digging where i'm at right now i i really love it do you guys still communicate hell yeah yeah we text all the time our kids have played together awesome um yeah we're friends how old are your sure. kids my my daughter is 13, my son is 11. Either of them have any uh musical abilities? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> They're completely not into it. Oh man. They're like, "Dude, that stuff is so loud." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, it's fucking rock and roll." <laughs> Do they understand who dad is? Yeah, they yeah, they okay. get it. Okay. You know, they're like, "Hey, I like taking a picture. It's pretty good. It's a pretty cool song." <laughs> You know. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, man, you know, Richard, I really appreciate you taking the time to just to you chat. You got it. it. It was a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, everything sounds it, it, everything sounds like it's going well for you. And I, I'm glad Hell to yeah. hear that. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the interest. And, um, and I appreciate you, you having me on the show and everything. And uh, uh, hopefully one of these days we'll bump in into each other on the on the road and you can see what see what filter's been doing the last couple i mean right now our live show is the shit it's so good it's got i mean an hour and a half of like just the best songs uh -huh. like like just the best fucking live songs and um i'm pretty stoked uh -huh. I'm, i wish you would have seen us in savannah you know i I've got kids at home too, so it makes it a little more difficult. But... See, that's the problem with rock. <laughs> now everybody's like, Everyone's "Oh, dude, <laughs> fuck the road trip." I got kids, bro. Yeah, and I I thought about it when I heard the advertisement. I was like, "Well, it's only about five hours away." And then Ooh, I, that's a long drive. It is long. That's what I'm saying with the kids. And See, I, if you were, you know, if you were 23 and you were tripping on acid, that would be a quick drive. Yeah, I would have been there. You would have been like, you know. I'm staying with Leslie and I'm going to stay at <laughs> Leslie's house and hang out in Savannah. <laughs> you still have the condo in Myrtle Beach or no? No, my dad sold that a long time ago. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're ever around, I'm going to uh, try and get out there and catch a show. I don't Fucking know. A, Bubba. I don't know how many uh, times you come near South Carolina. 
It's not much. Uh, the House of Blues. <laughs> we played the House of Blues, the House of Blues in Myrtle Beach, like ten times over the, over the years. All right. Well, that that's good. Is this uh, still there? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you get on, you d- get a tour go, and you'll stop by there again. I'll be there. Yeah, it'd be great. All right, buddy. Well, listen. You take care. Great talking to you. Thanks and, for uh, having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll talk okay. to you. Bye bye. See you. That's all for this week. Join us next week for another episode of the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show podcast. Available on all your favorite podcast listening platforms.